chapter seventeen of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva thus ended the might have beens and the thing that patricia had taken to be the phantom of romance went up in the smoke of john doe's fire mortimer crabbe never volunteered any information as to how he got the letters nor any information as to what became of heywood pennington for one horrible moment the thought crossed patricia's brain that perhaps there had never been any letters of hers in the package her husband had burned but she dismissed it at once as reflecting unpleasantly upon the quality of her intelligence but one thing was sure she now had an adequate understanding of the mind of her husband it was the only misunderstanding they had ever had and patricia knew there would never be another mr pennington did not appear again and so far as this veracious history is concerned after his departure from new york may have gone at once to jericho patricia ceased to think of him not because he was not present but because thinking of him reminded her that she had been a fool and no woman with the reputation for cleverness which patricia possessed could afford to make such an admission even to herself she was now sure of several things that she loved mortimer crabbe with all her heart and that she would never all her life long love any one else she might flirt yes nay more she must flirt what was the use of spending one's life in bringing an art to the perfection patricia had attained and then suddenly forswearing it fortunately her husband did not require that of her he never quite knew what she was going to do next but he never really mistrusted her and to patricia's credit it may be said that she never caused pain and that if she flirted she sometimes did it was in a good cause the building of the country place had gone forward during the winter and early summer found them installed there beginning with the housewarming which was memorable guests came and went and upon them all patricia practised her altruism which since the adventure with john doe had taken a somewhat different character yet even among these she found work for her busy hands to do it happened that among their guests the crabs had staying with them as a remnant of the housewarming party a young girl who because she was only a little younger than patricia in years but centuries younger in knowledge of the world had become one of her most treasured friends little miss north loved her too looked up to her as the ignorant do to the wise and when her engagement to the baron de launay was announced aurora came and told patricia even before she told her family yet patricia's shrewd mind found something wrong and she urged the girl to come and join her housewarming for the sole reason of finding out the true inwardness of the engagement and perhaps to who shall say to practice her arts again after a day or two of mild questioning of studying of watching she began to see light then she invited the baron for a weekend and made certain preparations then she waited his arrival with her nerves tingling she met her husband and the baron at the steps as they ascended from the machine which brought them from the station ah monsieur so glad i was wondering if you would be here in time for tea wild horses could not have detained me longer from a glimpse of your beaux yeux madame he bent forward with a handsome gesture and kissed the tips of patricia's fingers but she laughed gaily don't waste pretty speeches baron besides she paused significantly and pointed toward the door through which her husband's shoulders had disappeared she is there she finished Elas, 
the frenchman shrugged his shoulders expressively then straightened and showed his teeth in a smile since my speeches are wasted i will follow you in madame patricia paused all the world loves a lover even i yes yes if i could be sure that you loved you her sternly he shrugged again ah oh, yes i love her of course why otherwise should i wish to marry her i wonder slowly why you speak of my beaux yeux she said thoughtfully because i cannot help it a lover should be blind she put in like a husband he asked significantly like a wife she corrected soberly he followed her indoors where aurora met them at the door of the library tea aurora she announced will you pour it mort and i will be in in a moment she hovered in the doorway insistently until she saw delaunay safely seated on the davenport at the tea-table by aurora's side and only then she departed in the direction of the smoking-room mortimer crabb was drinking a glass of whisky and water at the sound of his wife's voice he turned did you get it mort she asked for reply he fumbled in the pockets of his dust coat and brought forth a small package oh yes here it is pretty insignificant affair to make such a fuss about and he handed it to her it's the little things that mean the most my dear husband like that she said significantly and this and she kissed him for his reward he held her away from him and looked at her good-humouredly the quizzical humour that was characteristic of him you never kiss me unless you're up to some mischief patty then you ought to be glad i'm mischievous mort it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good hmm. why all the mystery can't you tell a fellow she shook her head no why not because then you don't know as much as i do why shouldn't i he protested i'm your husband because if you knew as much as i do she paused you know mort it's only the ignorant husband who's entirely blissfully happy i'm not so sure about that he laughed aren't you happy mort she asked ah oh, hang it yes but then there's nothing left to be said and she kissed him again i can't understand she laid resisting fingers on his arm of course you can't that's one of your charms mort dear it's much better for a woman to be misunderstood the husband who understands his wife is on the highway to purgatory ask no more questions if i answer them i surely will lie to you what the deuce can daggett and mcdade be doing for you they're job printers they don't engrave your cards or stationery or anything no with a rising inflection well what i needed some printing well why not go to tiffany's the idea of your sending me away over on the east side they're such adorable printers mort who ever heard of a printer being adorable fudge what's the game now can't you tell a fellow no firmly crabb always recognized the note of finality in his wife's voice so he merely shrugged his shoulders and followed her with his eyes as she blew another kiss in his direction and vanished up the stairs in the privacy of her own room patricia did some cryptic things with newspapers a pair of scissors and the package from the adorable printers and when she had finished she folded up the newspapers with their mysterious contents including the scissors and with a fleeting glance at herself in the mirror went downstairs she entered the library noiselessly and after a glance at her guests at the tea-table she slipped her package into the drawer of the library table and joined them 
how envious you make me you too she sighed sinking into a chair you're so satisfied with yourselves and with each other delaunay smiled and fingered his teacup would you have it otherwise he asked oh no she said lightly i'm a professional nursery governess to polite and well-meaning persons of opposite sexes nursery governesses are not permitted emotions or opinions of any kind my dears but even nursery governesses are human i am told said delaunay showing his white teeth are they my governesses never were they were all inhuman like me the sight of youthful license arouses all my professional instincts that's why i'm in such demand by despairing mothers of romantic heiresses patty you're horrid aurora's heavily lidded eyes opened wide i'm not romantic not in the least and i'm not an heiress oh said patricia at least aurora amended not in the modern sense but it wouldn't matter to louis or to me if we really had to work for our living i'm so anxious to be of some use in the world oh we've planned that already haven't we louis yes said delaunay crisply with a glance of defiance in his eye for patricia we have planned that patricia's lips twisted but she said nothing i sometimes think patty went on aurora that you're a little unsympathetic won't you really like to see us married patricia laughed oh yes but not to each other why not you're too much in love dear for one thing c'est si bourgeois n'est-ce pas baron things are arranged better in france he shrugged his shoulders your customs in america are very pleasant ones he replied imperturbably i am indeed fortunate to find myself so much in accord with them aurora gave him a rapturous glance for reward and he took her fingers in his calm defiance of his pretty hostess patricia put down her finished teacup with a laugh and rose then i can't dismay you either of you aurora smiled scornfully not in the least can she louis not in the least he repeated oh very well your blood upon your own heads or in our hearts madame corrected delaunay with a bow come aurora smiled patricia it's time to dress patricia spent some time and some thought upon her toilet deep sea green was her color for it matched her eyes which to-night were unfathomable in the midst of her dainty occupation she turned her head over her shoulder and called her husband mortimer crabb appeared in the door of his dressing-room which adjoined one side of his face shaved the other white with lather what is it he mumbled patricia contemplated the back of her head at the dressing-table by the aid of a hand mirror removed the hairpins one by one from her mouth and deliberately placed them before she replied mart she said slowly i want you to take aurora out for a ride in the motor to-night oh i say patty to-night she said firmly i'll arrange it it will be dark and you're going to lose your way how do you know i am because i tell you so stupid you've got to lose your way for three hours he looked at her shrewdly what's up now tell me won't you i'm tired of rolling over and playing dead i am besides what can i do with that girl for three hours oh i don't care said patricia tell her stories romantic ones she likes those anything make love to her if you like so delaunay can make love to you peevishly i see i'm not going to stand for it 
i'm not any too keen on that fellow as it is he's neglecting aurora shamefully it is careless of him isn't it she said tilting her head back to get another angle on her headdress crabb took a step nearer brandishing his safety razor in righteous indignation it's a shame i tell you you don't seem to have any conscience or any sense of proportion you'd flirt with a cigar indian if there wasn't anything else around why can't you leave these young people alone do you think i like the idea of your spending the evening here snug and warm with that frenchman while i'm shuttling round with that silly girl in the dark mortimer you're ungallant what has poor aurora ever done to you she turned in her chair looked at him and then burst into laughter he watched her with a puzzled frown he never knew exactly how to take patricia when she laughed at him if you only knew how funny you look Maud dear there's a smudge of soap on the end of your nose and you look like a charlotte russe she rose slowly put her fingers on his arm and looked up into his eyes with a very winning expression don't be silly dear she said softly you know you said you weren't going to doubt me again ever i know what i'm about i have a duty a sacred duty to perform and you're going to take your share of it a duty she nodded you're not going to know until it's all over you mustn't question you're to be good and do exactly what i tell you to do won't you mort there i knew you would it's such a little thing to do she leaned as close to him as she could without getting soap on her face i'll tell you a secret if you promise to be nice i don't like the man really i don't not at all he looked her in the eyes and believed her you'll always get your way in the end don't you he said after a pause of course i do what would be the use of a way if one didn't have it that seemed unanswerable logic so crabb grinned you're a queer one patty which as patricia knew meant that she was the most extraordinary and wonderful of persons so she smiled at the back of his head as he went out because she agreed with him end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva patricia's dinner drew to its delectable close and coffee had already been served when the butler went to the front door and brought back a telegram on a silver tray patricia picked it up and turned it over daintily for you aurora she said aurora with apologies tore open the envelope and read her brow clouding i hope it's nothing serious said patricia sweetly sympathetic aurora rose hurriedly i don't know she said dubiously and then reading aunt jane is sick motor over this evening if possible there's no signature i suppose i'll have to go her lip protruded childishly how tiresome it's very inconsiderate of her isn't it said patricia the look of incomprehension still lingered on the young girl's face i can't see what she wants of me she murmured perhaps she's seriously ill patricia volunteered perhaps yes i must go of course but how can i mortimer patricia provided the cue i'll drive you aurora said crabb and louis delaunay made no sign i will take care of monsieur delaunay dear do you think you could trust me aurora's lips said of course but her eyes winked rapidly several times as she adapted her mind to the situation the decision reached delaunay stepped forward if you wish that i should go quite unnecessary put in patricia quickly if your aunt jane is sick aurora aurora hung in the wind a regretful moment oh yes he'd be in the way i'll leave him with you patty please don't flirt any more than you can help my dear child said patty with solemn conviction 
since poor foolish freddy winthrop engaged men are taboo besides to-night i have other plans i would not flirt if you could animate the apollo belvedere as mortimer so chastely puts it me for the downy at ten g m monsieur will doubtless practise pool shots or play a game of napoleon oh yes said the frenchman with a calmness which scarcely concealed the note of derision but aurora after one long look in his direction had vanished to don motor clothing and when she came down mortimer crabb with his quivering car awaited her in the drive patricia and the baron waved them good-bye from the porch and then went indoors to the subtle effulgence of the drawing-room patricia walked to the mantel turned her back to the fire and stretched her shapely arms along its shelf facing her guest with level gaze and a smile which was something between a taunt and a caress delaunay inhaled luxuriously the smoke of his cigarette and appraised his hostess through the half-closed eyes of the artist searching for a motif she was puzzling this woman like the vagrant color in a landscape in the afternoon sunlight which shimmered one moment in the sun and in the next was lost in shadowy mystery not the mystery of the solemn hills but the playful mystery of the woodland brook which laughs mockingly from secret places her eyes were laughing at him he felt it though none of the physical symbols of laughter were offered in evidence i'm so sorry monsieur she began in french it is such a pity there is no excuse for any one to have a sick aunt when the stage is set for sentiment i had planned your evening so carefully too you are the soul of kindness madame he said politely still studying her yes she went on slowly i think i am but then i am chez moi and charity you know begins at home i hope you will not call it charity charity they say is cold and you madame whatever you would seek to express are not cold how can you know your eyes my beaux yeux again she shrugged her shoulders and turned toward the door it is time i think for you to practise pool shots ah you are cruel he stepped before her and held out protesting hands i do not care for pool madame or napoleon no i wish to talk with you please she paused appraising him sideways i have some letters to write she said briefly please madame he stood before her his slender figure gracefully bent motioning appealingly toward the deep davenport which was set invitingly in front of the fire she followed his gesture with her eyes then with a light laugh passed before him and sat down nothing about my beaux yeux then she mocked he glanced at her with a smile which showed his fine teeth and sank beside her and at a distance voila madame you see i am an angel of discretion she smiled approvingly i'm glad we understand each other do we he asked with a suggestion of effrontery i hope so i'm not so sure to me you are still a mystery am i that's curious i've tried to make my meaning plain perhaps i can make it clearer for some weeks you have been making love to me monsieur i don't like it i never flirt except with the very ancient or the very youthful she said mendaciously you don't come within my age limits he laughed gaily love is of all ages and no ages i am both ancient and youthful old in hope young in despair in affairs of the heart i assure you a veritable babe in the arms i have never really loved until now why do you marry aurora then she put in he looked at her with a puzzled brow then laughed merrily 
madame you are too clever to waste your time in america but as patricia was looking very gravely into the fire he too relapsed into silence and frowned at the ash of his cigarette i do not see madame why we should speak of her he said sulkily it must be clear to you that our understanding is complete the marriage is in my country as you know oh yes i know she interrupted but miss north is different she has not the social ambitions of other girls miss north is romantic but quite unspoiled has it occurred to you that perhaps she may hope for a somewhat different relation between you we are good friends very good friends she is enchanting he said with enthusiasm so innocent of the ways of the world so talented so charming we shall be very happy i hope so dryly he examined her shrewdly you have her happiness close to your heart is it not so what is to be feared i shall be very good to her we understand each other she will be glad of the splendor of my ancient name and i desire the means to restore my estates and place myself in a position of influence among my people i care for her as one cares for a lovely flower but the mind the soul madame i have found them elsewhere he leaned forward and touched her fingers with his own patricia's gaze was far away it seemed as though she was unconscious of his touch it is a pity she said softly a great pity i am very sorry could you not learn to care a little she turned on him then but her voice was still gentle we are not in france monsieur she said coldly what does that matter he urged love knows nothing of geography love is a cosmopolite it cares not for time or place or convention i care for you very much madame and whatever you may think it makes me happy to tell you so and aurora patricia reiterated the word like the clanging of an alarm bell the baron relaxed his grasp and lowered his head she leaned forward elbow on knee looking into the fire you know baron i'm very sorry for aurora as he made no comment she went on she has always been a very sweet amiable honourable child i'm very fond of her she was very much alone with her books and her family she has always lived in an atmosphere of her own an atmosphere that she made for herself without companions of her own age her mother brought her up without the slightest knowledge of the guile the deceit or wickedness of the world in which some day she was to live they used stephen to scan the newspapers before she was permitted to read them and clip out objectionable paragraphs even i have done that since she has been here visiting me her father was always too busy making money to bother at the age of twenty she is still a dreamer old in nothing but years living in an idol of her own the sleeping princess in the fairy tale whom you the gallant prince have awakened with a kiss delaunay's shoulders moved slightly as he sighed that kiss monsieur you have awakened her she went on to what she paused abruptly and turned toward him for a reply your question is hardly flattering to my vanity he said smiling there are women she is a child all women are children i shall find means to make her happy patricia resumed her study of the fire i hope so with money your opportunities for happiness would be greater without money she paused and shook her head slowly the baron turned abruptly but patricia's gaze was fixed upon the fire when he spoke his tones were suppressed his manner constrained madame what do you mean she faced him slowly her expression gently sympathetic have you not heard heard what madame 
of monsieur north's misfortune you must have seen it in the newspapers the newspapers no what is it monsieur north has lost his money delaunay rose quickly one hand before him as though to ward off a blow what you tell me is impossible he said thickly no gravely it is true he stared at her unbelieving but her eyes met his calmly eagerly and in their depths he saw only pity would i not have heard this dreadful thing madame aurora would have told me she might have told you if she had known she did not know they want to save her the pain they always have that is one reason why she is stopping here with me don't you understand delaunay showed other signs of inquietude and was now pacing the rug nervously it is incredible he was saying incredible i cannot no and he stopped before her no i will not believe it patricia clasped her hands over her knees and was looking very gravely into the fire she had the air of a person who is mourning the loss of a very dear friend how do you know this he asked again anxiously from mrs north a week ago when she let aurora come to me but it is no secret now as it has been in the newspapers i have kept them from aurora she is so happy here with you i hadn't the heart to do anything to destroy her pleasure but north and company is a very great business house so rich that even in france we have heard of them yes mr north has been rich for years and then with a sigh it is very sad very very sad but how could such a thing happen surely he is wise enough speculation said patricia simply all of our businessmen speculate even the oldest the wisest delaunay sank into a chair at some distance his head in his hands dieu she heard him mutter what a terrible country i cannot believe patricia got up at last and walked over and put her hand quietly on his shoulder she was even smiling i am so sorry monsieur of course you know that don't you but i am sure everything will turn out for the best aurora loves you you must remember that poverty will make no difference in the relations between you she will even welcome the chance to be poor she wants to be of some real use in the world she has said so you had even planned for that monsieur the frenchman turned just one look in her direction a look in which despair inquietude inquiry and anger were curiously blended and then rose and strode the length of the room away you are mocking me you know madame that that it is impossible this marriage if what you tell me is true i wish i could reassure you slowly what proofs have you isn't my word enough yes but you want confirmation very well patricia walked to the library table opened its drawer and took out the sun and herald as she opened them two paper cuttings and a pair of scissors fell to the floor she picked them up before delaunay could reach her opening the newspapers both of which bore signs of mutilation and while he wondered what she was about to do or say she resumed calmly even indifferently i had clipped these papers that aurora might not see them since you profess some incredulity perhaps you'd rather read for yourself and she handed them to him he adjusted his monocle with trembling fingers and began reading the slips his lips moving his eyes dilated while patricia watched him her eyes masked by her fingers she saw him read one article through then scan the other his lips compressed his small chin working forward five million dollars he whispered at last it is terrible terrible and there will be nothing at all it looks so doesn't it she replied read on and he read the remainder of it aloud pausing at each sentence as though fascinated by the horror of it when he had read the last word the papers dropped from his fingers upon the tea-table beside him at a grimace his eyeglass dropped the length of its cord 
and he stood erect squaring his shoulders and straightening to his small height with the air of a man who has made a resolution madame he said more calmly this is very disagreeable news it's quite sad isn't it but i must warn you against speaking to aurora just yet the news is spreading fast enough and to-morrow it may be necessary to tell her in the meanwhile you must be gentle with her and tender you can comfort her so much she will need all your kindness now monsieur but delaunay had taken out his watch madame i thank you for your kindness to me but i am i am much perturbed i i do not want to see miss north until i can think what i must do would you mind if i went in town to my hotel to-night yes to-night she will think it strange for you to go without a word i i you could leave a note you will permit me patricia watched him seat himself heavily at her writing desk monsieur she asked what will you say to her that i am ill that i how will that help either you or her he shrugged his shoulders hopelessly what then madame i don't know she said slowly it is a very painful note to write i am very sorry for you sorry for miss north sorry for myself that you learned this through me it is curious that no one told you she sighed but perhaps it is just as well that you know i am grateful madame i cannot tell you how grateful he began but she held up her hand it pains me to see miss north unhappy but i know more of life than she does i was educated in france monsieur and i know what is expected of american girls who marry into the ancienne noblesse the noblesse de souche of course without a dot this marriage is impossible yes madame that is true it is impossible absolutely impossible aurora miss north believes in your love for her she will hardly understand delaunay swung around in his chair and rose facing the hostess there must be no misunderstanding between us decisively i shall go at once that your decision your final decision it is final by this time she stood beside him at the desk and as she spoke her finger pointed to the paper and ink then you must write her to-night before you go it would not be fair to leave matters to me it is not fair to her or to yourself sit down monsieur and write he sank into the chair again and what shall i write if i can help you sweetly i will write what you say with a sigh of relief so patricia seated herself beside him and with a troubled brow dictated in english my dear miss north i have learned with horror and dismay of the great bereavement which has fallen upon you and your family but in view of this misfortune i have thought it wisest to take my departure at once you will understand of course that under these conditions it is advisable to discontinue our present relations at once and as my presence might prove embarrassing i leave with feelings of great unhappiness you are doubtless aware of the customs of my country in the matter of settlements the absence of which would preclude the possibility of marriage on my part mrs crabb has kindly consented to make my apologies and excuses to you for my abrupt departure which i take with deep regret the deeper because of my profound esteem for your many delightful qualities of which you may be assured i shall never cease to think with tender and regretful sentiments patricia broke off abruptly i think that is all monsieur will you finish it as you please the baron nodded and added i am mademoiselle with profound assurances of my friendship and consideration yours 
louis charles bertram du chartres baron de launay patricia meanwhile had ordered the baron's suitcase packed and had phoned for a station wagon and a while later stood in the hallway speeding the parting guest must you go monsieur i am so very sorry i understand of course i am the loser and with all the generosity of a victorious general whose enemy is no longer dangerous if you are nice you may kiss my hand as delaunay bent over her fingers he murmured if it had only been you madame and in a moment he had gone End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva patricia stood in the hallway a moment looking at the note to aurora which she held in her fingers then she went to the desk so recently vacated by her guest and wrote steadily for an hour her thesis was the international marriage and she called it crab versus delaunay enclosing two papers delaunay's note and the newspaper clippings from her adorable printers slips of paper were pinned to them upon one of which she had written exhibit a and on the other exhibit b she sealed them all in a long envelope addressed to miss north and handed it to aurora's maid with instructions that it should be given to her mistress when she had gone up to her room from her own bed patricia heard the motor arrive and her husband fuming in the hallway below the sound of aurora's door closing and of mortimer's heavy footsteps in his own quarters then after a while silence she lay on her bed in the dark thinking listening intently it was long before she was rewarded then her door opened quietly and in the aperture the night lamp showed a pale tear-stained face and a slender girlish figure swathed in a pale blue dressing-gown patricia the girl half sobbed half whispered patty patricia rose in her bed and took the slender figure into her sheltering arms aurora darling i've been waiting for you can you forgive me yes yes sobbed the girl i understand you were too good for him aurora dear he wasn't worthy of you and then as an afterthought but then i don't know a man who is patricia breathed a sigh of relief she had thought it was going to be more difficult she made room for the girl in the bed beside her and soothed and petted her until she fell asleep poor aurora she murmured softly to herself you were never destined for a life like that child the man you marry is to be an american a fine young healthy animal like yourself i will not tell you his name because if i did you'd probably refuse him and of course that would never do it must be managed some way he's poor you know dear but then that won't matter because you will have enough for both it did not take aurora a great while to recover from the shock of disillusion and before long she was out on the golf links again with her usual happy following aurora had many virtues as well as accomplishments and patricia was very fond of her during the winter in the city she had given a dinner for her to which stephen ventnor was invited patricia's plan had succeeded admirably for ventnor after several years of indomitable faithfulness to the ashes of the mourned patricia had suddenly come to life he liked aurora so much that he didn't even take the trouble to hide his new emotion from patricia patricia sighed for even now renunciation was difficult to her but when she moved into the country for the summer she held out the latch-string to him for the weekends so that he could come out every week and play golf with aurora which showed that after all marriage had taught patricia something 
patricia had decided that aurora north was to marry steve ventnor and this resolution made she left no stone unturned to bring the happy event to a consummation the skilful maker of opportunities she remembered sometimes trusted to opportunity to make itself propinquity she knew was her first lieutenant and the unobtrusive way in which these two young people were continually thrown together must have been a surprise even to themselves ventnor took his two weeks of vacation in july and spent them at the crabs patricia had thought that those two weeks would have brought the happy business to a conclusion for aurora was just ready to be caught on the rebound and ventnor was now very much in love but when steve's vacation was over and he had packed his trunk to go mournfully back to town patricia knew that something had happened to change her well-laid plans she had never given jimmy mcclaymore a thought she had seen the three many times during the summer from her bedroom windows aurora steve and mcclaymore but the thought of aurora having a tenderness for the golfing automaton had never for a moment entered her mind she watched mr ventnor's departing back with mingled feelings you'll be out on saturday as usual won't you steve she asked oh yes thank you patty he replied i'll be out if you'll have me but there isn't much use you know don't be so meek steve she cried you're impossible when you're that way what earthly use did you make of all my training ventnor smiled mournfully you didn't begin soon enough patty he said that pleased patricia and she made a mental resolution that mary aurora steve should if it lay in her power to accomplish it there's something wrong with that girl she mused as she watched aurora and the sphinx as mcclaymore was familiarly called playing the fifth hole anybody who can see anything marriageable in jimmy mcclaymore ought to be carefully confined behind a garden wall jimmy i would as soon think of marrying a statue of buddha the blue wing was out of commission for the summer mortimer insisted that no sane man could maintain both a big yacht and a big country place but patricia was very happy and watched the development of steve ventnor's romance with a jealous eye she was obliged to admit as the summer lengthened into autumn that after all the whole thing was very much a matter of golf aurora was golf mad patricia knew and when jimmy mcclaymore ran down a twenty-foot putt for a bird on the sixteenth hole thereby winning three up and two from steve ventnor the golf championship of the country club patricia detached herself from the gallery which had followed the players and made her way sadly to the clubhouse veranda penelope wharton her sister who was fond of ventnor followed the picture of dejection in the morning round steve had been one up and the hopes of the two women had run high that their champion would be able to increase his lead during the afternoon or at least to maintain it against his redoubtable adversary but after the first two holes the victor had developed one of those streaks for which he was famous and though poor old steve had played a steady uphill game the luck went against him and he knew at the tenth hole that unless mcclaymore fell over in a fit the gold cup was lost for that year at least patricia realized too that the famous gold cup might not be the only prize at stake and now she said wrathfully she'll probably marry that person mr mcclaymore would have withered could he have seen the expression in patricia's eyes for when patricia called any human being a person it meant that her thoughts were unutterable i suppose so said penelope i've no patience with aurora north said patty she's absolutely lacking in a sense of proportion imagine letting one's life happiness hang on the fate of a single putt and steve is such a dear he is 
that's the worst of it and they're eminently fitted for each other in every way by birth breeding and circumstances as a sportsman jimmy may be a success but as a gentleman as a lover as a husband patricia's two brown hands were raised in protest toward olympus it's odious pen a case for a grand jury or a coroner aurora is too nice a girl sighed penelope nice in everything but discrimination that's the peril of being an out-of-door girl the more muscle the less gray matter that kind of thing disturbs the balance of power patricia sighed oh i tried it and i know a woman with too much muscle is like an over-rigged yawl all right in light airs but dangerous in a blow what's the use our greatest strength after all is weakness i'm sure you couldn't convince aurora of that nor steve i don't know said patricia slowly but i'd like to try further talk was interrupted by the arrival of the crowd from the fair green thirsty and controversial steve ventnor like the good loser that he was had been the first to shake mcclaymore by the hand in congratulation and if he was heavy of heart his smiling face gave no sign of it for the present at least he had abandoned the field to his conqueror who brought up the rear of the gallery with aurora accepting handshakes right and left with the changeless dignity which had gained him his sobriquet of sphinx at the veranda steps mortimer crabb took him in tow and brought him to the table where penelope and patricia were mournfully absorbing lemonade too bad steve said patricia with a brightness that failed to deceive nobody with mere blood in his veins can expect to compete with a hydraulic ram he's a wonderful piece of mechanism jimmy is but i'm always tortured with the fear that he may forget to wind himself up some morning mort couldn't you have dropped a little sand in his bearings oh he's got plenty of sand said crabb generously he's a cracking good golfer said steve looking reprovingly at patricia he's the better man that's all he sank beside patricia while crabb had a steward take the orders no muttered patricia not that not the better man only the better golfer steve and then with a sudden and mystifying change of manner do you know why he always wears a crimson vest no i've never thought replied steve it's very un er, unprofessional isn't it it isn't what a man wears that wins holes you know patty oh no she said carelessly i was just wondering mortimer crabb unofficial host of the occasion had beckoned to aurora and mcclaymore who now joined the party steve ventnor rose as the girl approached and their eyes met aurora's eyes were the color of lapis lazuli but the deep tan of her skin made them seem several shades lighter they were handsome eyes very clear and expressive and at important moments like the present ones her long lashes effectually screened what might have been read in their depths i'm sorry steve she said gently you didn't have enough practice are you really asked steve he bent his head forward and said something for aurora's ears alone at which her lids dropped still further and the ends of her lips curved demurely but she did not reply and turned in evident relief when crabb made a hospitable suggestion patricia watched the by-play with interest she had followed the romance with mingled feelings for it was apparent that the triangle which had been equilateral in the spring was now distorted out of all semblance to its former shape with poor steve getting the worst of it the reason was clear the sphinx was rich and could afford to play golf with aurora every day of the year if he wished while steve ventnor who spent his daylight hours selling bonds in the city had to make the most of his saturday and sunday afternoons it was really too bad but the sphinx only smiled his unhumorous smile 
and went on playing golf during the week when ventnor was at work propinquity had done a damage which even patricia with all her worldliness could not find available means to repair but she joined good-humouredly in the toasts to the new club champion who was accepting his honours carelessly keeping her eyes meanwhile on jimmy mcclaymore's crimson vest that vest was a part of jimmy's golf as much a part of it as his tauric glasses his preliminary wiggle on the tee or his maddening precision on the putting green it fascinated her somehow almost to the exclusion of the gaiety in which she rightfully had a part the gold cup was brought forth and passed from hand to hand as it came to patricia she looked at it inside and out read the inscription leisurely then handed it carelessly to her neighbor chaste and quite expensive was her comment oh i think it's beautiful said aurora reprovingly chaque enfant son goo goo my dear said patricia you know aurora i never did approve of golf prizes especially valuable ones after all golf is merely a game not a religion it's the habit in this club to consider a golf cup with the same kind of an eye th that one gives to a possible seat in paradise even steve ventnor thought patricia's remarks in bad taste if jimmy plays the game of life the way he played golf to-day he laughed he'll have an eighteen carat halo and no mistake patty exclaimed miss north reprovingly you know you don't believe a word you say you love golf prizes why you are always giving the bachelor's cup and this year you've presented the cup for the affinity foursomes besides you've won at least three prizes yourself i've reformed said patricia decisively i've lost patience with golf i haven't any interest in a game that requires the elimination of all human attributes what on earth are you talking about one can't be entirely human and play a good game of golf that's all she announced that's rough on mcclaymore laughed mortimer it's human to be irritated human to be angry human to have nerves human to make mistakes i've no patience with people who can't lose their tempers i'm apt to lose mine if you keep calling me names said the sphinx affably you couldn't jemmy said patricia soberly any one who can make the tenth eleventh and twelfth in eleven playing out of two bunkers will never lose his temper in this world or anything else she added sotto voce there won't be any more bachelor's cups then not if i can help it at least not for the ancient and honourable game as we play it now the bachelor's cup this fall will be played for across country the members of the party examined her as though they believed she had suddenly been bereft of her senses all but her husband who knew that in being surprised at patty one was wasting valuable energy but even mortimer was mildly curious across country they asked exactly i'm going to invest the game with a real sporting interest develop the possibilities of the niblick eliminate the merely mechanical introduce a stronger element of chance the course will be laid out like a drag with an anise seed bag queried crabb patricia withered her husband with a look with scraps of paper she asserted firmly the course will be four miles long of a good hunting country you can't mean it said mcclaymore i do it's quite feasible yes but it's a good sporting proposition said aurora north suddenly kindling to interest why not ventnor and mcclaymore only smiled amusedly as became true golfers oh you can laugh you two why not give it a trial just to make it interesting i'll offer a cup for the club's champion and run her up it will be a pretty cup and aurora and i will caddy willingly laughed aurora there the matter stopped it was a joke of course and both men realized it but 
any joke in which aurora north had a part was the joke for them a week passed before patricia completed her plans and in the meanwhile everybody had forgotten all about her amazing proposition it was therefore with surprise and not a little amusement that mcclaymore and ventnor received the dainty notice in patricia's handwriting which advised them that the cross-country match would be played off on the following thursday afternoon at two o'clock jimmy mcclaymore smiled at a photograph on the desk in his library but later in the day after a talk over the telephone with aurora he got a mashie and a heavy mid-iron from his bag and went out in his own cow pasture to practice steve ventnor in his office in the city turned the note over in his fingers and frowned thursday was his busiest day but he realized that he had given his promise and that if mcclaymore played he must it was a very silly business several things mystified him however what did patricia mean for instance by the absurd lines at the bottom of his invitation aurora will caddy for you and don't wear a crimson vest there's nothing to be gained by it on a slip of paper enclosed were the local rules one the first ball and every fourth ball thereafter may be played from a rubber tee two a ball in casual water may be lifted and dropped without penalty three running brooks ponds rocks fences etc are natural hazards and must be played over as such for a lost ball means the loss of one stroke but not of distance a ball may be dropped within twenty-five yards of the spot where ball disappeared five the match must be finished within four hours the competitor who for any reason fails to finish loses the match steve ventnor smiled as he read but in spite of his golf sense which is like no other sense in the world felt himself gently warming to the project he would go of course for aurora was to caddy for him End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva even mortimer crabb was excluded from that charming luncheon of four it was very informal and great was the merriment at patricia's expense but through it all she smiled calmly at their scepticism as columbus at salamanca must have smiled if he ever did or newton or edison or any others of the world's great innovators cross-country golf she continued proudly to assert is the golf of the new era do you really mean it patty asked aurora seriously when the men had gone upstairs to change of course i do aurora the ancient and honourable game has its limitations cross-country golf has none you'll see my dear in ten years there'll be plain distance matches between new york and philadelphia the fewest strokes in the shortest time that will be a game and who'll pay for the lost balls asked aurora laughing that aurora replied patricia with a touch of dignity is something with which i am remotely concerned the men came downstairs dressed for the fray grinning broadly and patricia after a glance at mcclaymore's red vest took up his golf bag with a business-like air and led the way to the terrace the sphinx blinked through his tauric glasses at her unresponsive back silhouetted in the doorway but as aurora had taken steve's bag he followed meekly submitting to the inevitable outside patricia was indicating a rift in the row of maples which bordered her vegetable garden through which was to be seen the brown sweep of the meadow beyond 
the drive is through there you'll get the direction marks for your second the distance is four miles the finish is on aurora's lawn the putting green near the rear portico of the house drive off gentlemen the honor was mr mcclaymore's with a saddish smile half of pity and half of a protest for his outraged golfing dignity he took his bag from patricia and with a frugality which did him credit upturned the bag on the lawn spilling out a miscellany of old balls which he had saved for practice strokes selecting half a dozen he stuffed five of them in his pockets returned the newer ones to his bag and scorning the rubber tea which patricia offered him dropped a ball over his shoulder and took his cleek out of his bag each act was sportsmanlike a fine expression of the golfing spirit the drive went straight and they saw it bouncing coquettishly up the meadow beyond steve with the munificence which only poverty knows brought forth a new ball took the rubber tee and with his driver got off a long low one which cleared the bushes and vanished over the brow of the hill a new golfing era has begun said patricia with the air of a prophet if i ever find my ball said ventnor dubiously what do you care steve as long as you're making history laughed aurora with a sly glance at their hostess patricia unperturbed led the way through a breach in the hedge and out into the sunlight where she raised a crimson parasol which no one had noticed before my complexion she explained to aurora one can't be too careful when one gets to be uh, hmm, thirty and besides it just matches jimmy's vest the grass in the pasture was short and mcclaymore played his brassy his caddy instructing him as to the ground on the other side which fell gently down to a brook he could not reach i really got that one away said mcclaymore livening to his task it's not really bad going at all patricia smiled gratefully but made no response for steve a little further on was in a hole and had to play out with a mashie which he did with consummate skill the ball rolling down the hill thirty yards short of mcclaymore's from the hilltop they could easily see the line of the paper chase which patricia had laid when she rode over the course yesterday it stretched across the lower end of the renwick's meadows along the road crossing two streams bordered with willow trees and led straight for waterman's stone quarry ventnor played a careful mid-iron which cleared the brook and bounded forward into the meadow beyond but mcclaymore overreached himself trying for a distance and found the brook losing his ball and two strokes but he teed up having played five and laid six well down the meadow within carrying distance of the second stream but steve playing steadily passed him with his fourth a long cleek shot which fell just short of the stream beyond the creek was the hill to the quarry three shots for mcclaymore two long ones for ventnor with excellent judgment mcclaymore played safely over the creek with a mid-iron reaching the brink of the quarry in two more which gave him a chance to tee up on his ninth for the long drive across steve ventnor was less fortunate dribbling his sixth up the hill fifty yards short of the quarry into which trying a long cleek shot to clear it he unfortunately drove he waited to see the sphinx carefully tee his ball and send it straight down the course which patricia indicated and then taking the bag from his caddy helped her into the path which zigzagged down to where his ball lay a hundred feet below 
patricia and the sphinx had chosen the shorter way through the woods at the upper end and steve and aurora were alone at the bottom of the slope behind a projecting crag steve stopped and faced his companion aurora he said yes steve is it true you're going to marry mcclaymore aurora picked a flower which grew in a ledge beside her before she replied why do you ask i thought i'd like to know that's all people say you are i haven't said so then eagerly you aren't i don't see what right you've got to ask i haven't only i thought i'd like to be the first to congratulate him oh is that all and i thought i'd like to tell you again that i love you better than anybody could and that i always will even if you marry him he's a very nice fellow but but i'll be very unhappy will you i don't believe it why do you say that because you're too cool about it you wouldn't think he was such a nice fellow if you were jealous of him why haven't you played more with me this summer i had to work you know that what's the use if you love me as you say you do i don't see how you could be so cool about about seeing us together perhaps i wasn't as cool as i looked see here aurora you mustn't talk like that he had turned and before she could escape him had taken her in his arms and was kissing her don't say i'm cool i love you aurora with every ounce that's in me i want you more than i can ever want anything in this world or the next i'm not going to let you marry that fellow or anybody else do you understand she had yielded for a moment to his warmth because there didn't seem to be anything else to do but when she slowly disengaged herself from his arms and faced him her eyes were wet and the color flamed through her tan steve she stammered steve how could you but he still faced her passionately undaunted it's true he said huskily i love you you can't marry him i won't let you he took a step forward but this time she retreated don't steve not again not now you mustn't they'll be coming out in the open there in a moment i'll never say you are cool again never after that you're not cool not in the least i was mistaken i've never seen you like this before you're different you made me do it i couldn't stand your saying i didn't care i'm not sorry he went on he couldn't love you the way i do i think perhaps you're right said aurora coolly in the meantime won't you give me an answer in the meanwhile she went on preening her disordered hair you are supposed to be playing the golf of the new era aurora no she had taken up his golf bag and was walking away won't you answer me he pleaded get your ball out of this quarry she said relentlessly and i'll think about it it took steve ventner thirteen strokes to play out of that quarry which for a fellow with a record of seventy-two at apawomek was going it the first stroke he missed clean the second he sliced into a clay bank his third struck the rocks and bounded back against the wall behind him finding lodgment at last in some bushes where he took three more to make matters worse aurora was laughing at him hysterically unrestrainedly and patricia and the sphinx who had appeared on the path above were joining in the merriment oh i'll lift he growled at last you can't laughed aurora it's against the rules and patricia appealed to confirmed the statement three more swings he took each of them in impossible lies the last of which smashed his niblick after that there followed a period of strange calmness of desperation while he worked his ball into a good lie on the far side of the quarry from which with a fine mashie shot he lifted it over the cliffs and into the open beyond 
steve ventnor toiled wearily up the hill at the heels of his caddy struggling for his lost composure he caught up with aurora at a point halfway up where he took the golf bag from her shoulder and faced her again won't you answer me aurora he pleaded breathlessly no i won't she said calmly you swore horribly in the bushes i didn't i heard you i'll never marry a man who swears and she hurried on when ventnor joined the others he found patricia sitting on a rock making up the score which at the present moment stood ventnor twenty mcclaymore nine how do you like it steve asked patricia still figuring oh it's great said steve ironically holding up his shattered niblick i like granite it's so spongy i'm afraid you've got a bad temper steve but ventnor had taken out his pipe lit it and was now doggedly moving toward his ball the luck favored him on his next volley for playing two mid-irons down the hill he reached the level meadow below safely while mcclaymore sliced his second into a row of hot frames where an indignant horticulturist and two dogs contributed an interesting mental hazard but the sphinx handed the farmer a dollar in exchange for lacerated feelings and glass and the match went on over the brook mcclaymore lay thirteen having dubbed his shot into the stream but playing steadily after that reached the top of the long hill before them safely in four more while ventnor lost his ball in the bushes and was now playing twenty five end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva from there on the luck varied and at the stockbridge farm the score stood mcclaymore twenty one ventnor thirty it seemed a difficult lead to overcome for the sphinx was playing straight with a mid-iron while steve whose only hope lay in getting distance had twice pulled into rough grass which cost him lost balls and extra strokes the wonder was how he played it all for aurora had refused to marry him three times in the last twenty minutes the result was inevitable and so like the man in the adage after playing thirty-eight strokes he went up in the air missing shot after shot and relinquishing all claim to consideration playing on only because fate seemed to demand it of him at the van westervelt's fence both men got off good ones landing well in the middle of the pasture and had gone forward into the field their caddies close behind them when from the shelter of a clump of trees along the stream to their left there emerged a shadow aurora saw it first it's a bull she said no it's only a cow ventured the sphinx whose tauric glasses were not adjusted to distances or to bulls i'm sure it's a bull repeated aurora steve glanced at the beast over his shoulder and then took a brassy from his bag he won't bother us he muttered but the animal was approaching majestically pausing now and then to paw up the dirt with his front hoofs and throwing a cloud of dust over his back it's your parasol patty said aurora or jimmy's vest put in patricia you'd better run for it you and aurora said ventnor you can easily make the fence and you i'm going to play this shot it's the prettiest lie i've had all day come aurora said patricia taking up her bag there's no time to lose he's really coming this way and gathering up her golf bag and skirt she ran the sphinx meanwhile still holding his mid-iron in his hand was undecided 
his ball was twenty yards further on and his eyes shifted uneasily from the bull to an old apple tree within a reaching distance the women by this time had reached a convenient stile and were perched upon it shouting run steve they cried he's coming ventnor who was addressing his ball glanced up for a moment and then swung it was the prettiest shot that he had made all day for the ball started with a low trajectory and soared and soared clearing the fence on the far side of the field a carry of two hundred yards and landed in the next meadow then he turned club in hand and looked at the bull which now stood twenty paces away eyeing them viciously it was too late to make a sprint for the fence and like mclaymore steve wistfully eyed the apple tree but he brandished his brassy manfully and prepared to jump aside if the bull lowered his head and rushed him it was at this moment that jimmy mclaymore white as a sheet made up his mind to run jimmy's red vest decided the matter and scorning ventnor with a bellow which lent wings to jimmy's feet the brute lowered its thick head and charged passing like a tornado under the limb to which mclaymore had fled for safety steve ventnor forgot to be frightened and stood leaning on his club roaring with laughter for the sphinx's dignity had always been a fearful and wonderful thing to him he heard the voices of the women behind him pleading with him to run but in his heart steve ventnor made a mighty resolution that run he would not he had no dignity like jimmy's to lose but the spectacle jimmy made decided him it took some strength of mind to moderate his pace as he picked up patricia's red parasol and walked toward the fence the bull however refused to be distracted and stood pawing the ground beneath the apple tree bellowing up at the soles of the sphinx's boots and making a havoc of the beautiful campbell mid-iron which was the only thing of jimmy's that he could touch the women on the stile were laughing patricia frankly uncontrollably aurora nervously looking at steve as he came up with a queer little anxious wrinkle between her eyebrows i haven't any patience with you she said you might have been gored to death ventnor was still laughing i never saw jimmy run before he said we'll have to get him out of that somehow i think i'll have a try at it with patricia's parasol but patricia quickly snatched it from his hand her little drama had worked out far more beautifully than she had ever hoped it would and she didn't propose to have it ruined now nothing of the sort she cried you may do whatever you like with your own skin but that is a perfectly good french parasol and it's mine and she put it behind her back meanwhile the sphinx was pelting the brute below him with apples and shouting anathema both of which rolled from the animal's impervious back as he circled angrily around the tree up which he showed every disposition to climb from tragic comedy the scene had degenerated into broadest farce it's like southern playing a part of georgie cohan's commented patricia sweetly is he apt to be there all day it looks so said aurora struggling between anxiety and laughter we really ought to do something but patricia had settled herself comfortably on the top rail of the fence things were going very much to her liking what she asked tell somebody there's a wagon coming this way now but how about the cross-country cup looking at her watch there's only an hour and a half to finish in but we can't leave him up there said steve more seriously that bull will be there until until the cows come home jimmy is perfectly safe said patricia unless he goes to sleep and falls out and he can't starve unless he throws all the apples at the bull patty you're heartless said aurora but she laughed when she said it 
the farmer who came along in the wagon took in the situation at a glance and laughing more loudly than any of them consented at last to drive to the barnyard and tell the farmer it won't do any good he said sagely that bull won't go back until he follows the cows at milking time he might quit before that i don't know i'll do what i can though and with a laconic chirrup to his nag he departed in the direction of the van westervelt's farmyard the party of three followed him with their eyes until he had disappeared in a cloud of dust and then examined the apple tree from which the sphinx's legs dangled hopelessly the rest of him was hidden among the leaves until the cows come home said patricia solemnly and looking into one another's eyes all three of them burst into shameless laughter and with that laugh freemasonry was established it was plainly to be read in aurora's eyes the toppling of jimmy's dignity had been too much for her own sense of gravity patricia meanwhile had taken out her watch this my dear children she said indicating with a fine gesture the sphinx's apple tree is one of the hazards of the new game of golf there's only an hour and a half to finish in play the game you two i must wait it wouldn't be the sporting thing said steve struggling with a desire to obey i'd like to know who is as good a judge of the rules of a game as its inventor said patricia am i right aurora aurora by this time was fingering at the strap of ventnor's golf bag yes she decided as patricia says it's in the game steve glanced at her quickly joyfully but her head was lowered and she was already down the steps of the stile and walking along the road toward the adjoining meadow ventnor's eyes met patricia's for the fraction of a second of wireless telegraphy after which steve plunged down the steps and followed his caddy the gabled roof of augustus north's house was visible above the trees scarcely half a mile away but the paper chase led to it by devious sequestered ways which steve ventnor and his caddy scrupulously followed many times on the way they stopped in the shadow of the trees and but a few minutes of time remained when steve ran down his putt it had taken him just one hundred and three shots to do that last nine hundred yards in an hour and forty minutes his caddy counted them which only went to prove her a conscientious person for under the circumstances bookkeeping was a difficult matter perched upon her style in smiling patience patricia waited until the cows came home while mortimer crabb who had been notified over the telephone of the disaster drove up to see the final chapter in jimmy mcclaymore's undoing for the farmer came and at some pains extracted him from his perilous post the crabs drove mcclaymore to his home in their motor and then ran over to the north's to hear how the cross-country match had finished the happy couple met them at the steps the ball is in the hole patty dear said steve ventnor do i win the cup you do said patricia looking at her watch by three hours and a half and it's a loving cup steve with cupids and things i had it made especially for you and aurora aurora kissed patricia with enthusiasm how did you know patty it was to be steve simplest thing imaginable because steve is the most adorable boy always excepting mort that was ever born and then you know aurora you couldn't have married jimmy that's true said aurora thinking of jimmy's legs in the apple tree i really couldn't steve refused to return to the crabs to dinner so the makers of opportunities departed alone mortimer drove slowly through the gathering dusk and patricia sat silent are you happy patty he asked at last no of course not said patricia pinching his ear you know i'm never happy with you mort 
aren't you getting a little tired of putting the world in order oh yes but young people are so provoking they can never make up their own minds and you know somebody has to do it for them haven't you ever wondered how the world would get on without you no but sometimes i've wondered how you would i ha i wouldn't get on at all and yet you know there's a responsibility in being married to a dea ex machina what please the machinery may run down and then the goddess may end in the ditch mort or get a blow-out you came near it patty i didn't mort ever how about he was going to say john doe but she put her fingers over his lips so that he only mumbled no mort i'm a prudent goddess a chauffeuse extraordinary i'm sure of that but but what no car can endure so long out of the garage you're a silly old thing she sighed comfortably and leaned her head over on his shoulder in a moment she spoke again i think you're quite right though mort aren't you tired of making opportunities for other people she made a sound that he understood i am a little you know patty he added the motor purred gently as it glided out of a country road into the turnpike what do you say if we begin making opportunities for each other she started up with a laugh i never thought of that she said when shall we start at once patty if you'll provide the opportunity and he kissed her i'll be its thief but she captured him at once end of chapter twenty one end of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs